Hola, bienvenidas y bienvenidos nuevamente a Casa Árabe Online. Welcome to uh, this new session. This is the 12th session of Aula Árabe Universitaria on this um, uh, splendid uh, spring day in Madrid. Uh, Aula Árabe Universitaria is our collaboration with the Spanish universities, uh, which today is pairing as well with Aula Mediterránea, a program led by the uh, EMED, the European Institute of the Mediterranean in Barcelona. Uh, we are delighted to have joined forces and uh, we're very happy to have students from uh, both programs uh, attending this this, uh, this specific session. Today, uh, we will tackle the European Union's policies after the so-called Arab Spring, and mostly how they failed to meet the uh, democratic expectations of the people that took part in the popular uprisings. So we welcome Professor Andrea Tetti, Professor of International Relations at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, this talk, as I was saying, is done uh, with uh, collaboration in collaboration with the Master Eurosud or Eurosud, South European Studies of Madrid's Autonomous University, represented by Ignacio Gutierrez de Terán, Ola Iñaki, and also with the Master in Diplomacy and International Organizations of the University of uh, Barcelona and its uh, Center of uh, International Studies, uh, represented by uh, Jordi Quero, who will give us a reaction after Professor Tetti's intervention. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Hello, Jordi. Greetings to Barcelona. Uh, and first, we will hear from Iñaki uh, a short introduction of Andrea's biography. He will be uh, addressing this, um, this introduction mostly to the students of his program, therefore he will uh, be um, speaking in Spanish. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. We welcome uh, our friend Andrea Tetti to this dissertation about how European Union policy falls the Arab uprisings. And we are here in Spanish, unas breves líneas sobre el ponente, y a continuación damos paso a la ponencia. Doy la bienvenida a los alumnos del Máster de Estudios Árabes e Islámicos de la Autónoma, y de los compañeros de Eurosud, que vienen en algún caso de la Universidad de Glasgow. Bien, Andrea Tetti es el director del grupo de investigación sobre sociedades del European Center for International Affairs. Tiene un máster y un doctorado por la Universidad de St. Andrews y actualmente es profesor de Relaciones Internacionales en la Universidad de Aberdeen. Además de profesor visitante en la Gram Lab de la Universidad de Cagliari. Sus principales intereses de investigación y publicaciones se centran en las políticas europeas y estadounidenses, por eso está hoy aquí, evidentemente, y en la promoción de la democracia en Oriente Medio, así como la política egipcia, los movimientos islamistas, la sociedad civil y los movimientos laborales. Es también codirector del grupo de trabajo Critical Middle East Studies, CMS, de la British Society for Middle East Studies. Anteriormente fue profesor de Relaciones Internacionales de las Universidades de Exeter y Plymouth y profesor visitante en la Universidad de Turín y en la Cátedra Anna Lim de Estudios Euromediterráneos de la Universidad de Salerno. Creo que queda bien demostrada la competencia y habilidad del ponente. Por lo tanto, le damos la bienvenida a whenever you want. Welcome, Andrea. Muchísimas gracias, Ignacio, y también a Jordi. Uh, and Karim for your invitation. I apologize, I can't speak in Spanish, but it's terrible. My Spanish is terrible. Um, and thank you also very much to Olivia Orozco and uh, Elizabeth Ezireta Chukarelli, who, have, uh, who are part of the program as well. Gracias, eh, gracias Iñaki. So let's start uh, with, with the subject. After a, a very um, timid, shy initial response to the Tunisian revolution, uh, in uh, early 2011, that's 10 years ago, the European Union uh, proclaimed quite loudly to have learned the lessons from the Arab Springs. According to Brussels, um, past policy didn't work because uh, supporting authoritarian regimes in the name of stability uh, or gradual reformism did not produce democratization and there was a need for uh, 
a paradigm shift, uh, a change uh, in order to be much more inclusive. Uh, however, uh, these uh, commitments or these intentions uh, did not really um, translate into uh, into actions and, and proper deeds. And by 2015, the, uh, the EU had uh, returned to prioritizing uh, stability uh, as it showed in its acquiescence to the army-led coup in, uh, in Egypt. So how has uh, it been possible for the European Union to um, um, publicly um, proclaim uh, its, uh, its break uh, with past policies while uh, at the same time reproducing those uh, precise strategies uh, that uh, um, may unwillingly contribute to destabilizing the uh, Mediterranean? Um, on both shores. So Andrea Tetti, uh, which has already been, who has already been presented by our friend uh, Ignacio, uh, will lead us through the answer in this two-part lecture. Uh, the first will be more centered on the EU's uh, construction of democracy. And the second part will be um, more, uh, uh, let's say, focused on the uh, Middle East and North Africa region uh, and its populations a thirst for democracy. So the floor is yours and thank you very much, Andrea, for joining us. Um, okay, Andrea told us that- Thanks, Karim. I, um, okay, uh, there you are. I hope to uh, give some help. Seconds. Okay, good start. So, if you can, uh, if you can see me and, and hear me, um, I think. I mean, I wouldn't be so arrogant as to say that I have uh, the answers, but I have some elements of an answer. Okay. So, and you will see already from the the, the cover slide um, that um, alongside or in the background from uh, two iconic images from the uh, Egyptian Revolution, Tahrir uh, Square in the in, in the at the bottom there. There is a, there's another image which is uh, you know turned around, but it's another image, and it's the image of uh, your beautiful capital city, Madrid. It's Acampalasol, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to suggest, even in this initial graphic, that the the themes, the problems, the issues that we're going to talk about in the next hour or so are not. Uh, simply questions of the relationship between the European Union and its southern neighborhood, in, in this case, uh, uh, yeah, in the, in the southern neighborhood. Um, they, the root of these issues is much deeper than that, and it has to do with Europe's own politics. So there's a connection, there's a deep connection between the, uh, the uh, near abroad of the European Union and its domestic politics. Um, so we'll hopefully talk about that uh, uh, at the end or maybe in the Q&A se section. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as you can see, the talk is conceived in two parts. The first part, we will focus on what the European Union thinks it does when it promotes democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the specific instance of the South Mediterranean, but also uh, in more generally in the, in the neighborhood, so the Eastern and the Southern neighborhood. I will focus on the question of democracy. There are other major themes like security development and technical issues like conditionality, like how these policies are then delivered. Uh, but I'll focus only on the question of democracy. And in a second part, we'll look at uh, not what the European Union thinks it does when it promotes democracy, yeah, how it thinks about democracy, what sort of democracy it thinks it's supplying. Uh, we'll look at, uh, to use uh, my first degree is economics. So uh, it, it's, uh, the language is still there. The demand side, you know, what is it that people want as, uh, as the saying went about 10 years ago. To do so, normally uh, people who specialize in, in our areas of interest will work with uh, social movements, with uh, elite interviews, focus groups, etc. Um, and all of that is incredibly important. What I'm going to do for this presentation is to focus on what survey data, public opinion survey data tells us, right? 
um, because it's used in a certain way in orthodox political science, mainstream political science. But I think there's, there is a, well, the, the group of us who have been working on this over the last five or six years, we think that there's a much deeper story to tell. So we're going to give you elements today of that second, uh, of, of that story in the second part uh, of, the inter of, the, uh, um, of the talk. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the first part, like I said, we're going to concentrate on what the EU thinks it's doing when it supplies democracy and it democratizes, when it assists democracy in the neighborhood. Now, for those of you who are more technically minded and want to know more about the methodological aspect, uh, what, uh, what we've done is we've looked we've, uh, at a series of key documents uh, in uh, strategy documents for the European neighborhood. Uh, most of them are listed here. There are, of course, a lot more, but the analysis that I'm going to present, the claims I'm going to present, hold for these other documents as well. But these are the strategy documents before and after the uprising. So we looked uh, at what the European Union thought it was doing and said it was doing before and after the uprisings. Um, and we looked, as I said, in particular at the question of democracy and specifically at two related questions. First of all, the role of human rights in the conception of democracy. What does the European Union talk about when it talks about this? It turns out that this is really important. It sounds obvious, but it turns out it's important. And uh, secondly, what sort of uh, development strategies, what it calls inclusive growth, um, what sort of economic strategies, what's the logic underpinning those in uh, uh, and, and their relationship with, with democracy, democratization, turns out. That's also really important. Um, just a couple of caveats. Uh, I also conducted quite a lot of interviews, especially around uh, 2008 to 2012, 13 in Brussels. None of this appears in my published work because I used it to corroborate um, the textual analysis, but so the analysis is not limited to just the, the text. Um, and finally, a caveat about the text themselves. No one is claiming that the European Union thinks it's monolithic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a wide variety of positions inside the European Union, inside the institutions and member states of the European Union, etc. So, you know, if you have questions about that, feel free to ask me in the, in the Q and A. Uh, but what this analysis does is it provides a kind of baseline. Uh, a framework, a discursive, conceptual and policy framework within which the European Union does democracy assistance. And of course, the recipients, uh, recipient states, uh, target uh, countries, populations, um, activist movements, social movements, political parties react to, um, uh, to these policies. So next slide, please. What we'll see in the next slide. Okay, so like I said before, uh, um, there are three main dimensions that I looked at, the question of delivery and development and the question of democracy. Delivery and development, it turns out that the conceptions of uh, conditionality, what was called positive conditionality before the uprisings and what became the more for more approach um, after the uprisings, are virtually identical. What's positive conditionality? Well, if you, if you fulfill the agreements, for example, the association agreements between the EU and, and uh, South Mediterranean states, if you, Mediterranean state, fulfill the, the obligations of those, the objectives of those agreements, I will, uh, European Union will give you something more, yeah, more investment, accelerated timetables for uh, market access, etc. cetera. Um, and that's exactly what the more for more approach means. So, so much for change on that count. Development. Uh, here, um, the, the, it's quite clear, without going into any detail, it's quite clear that the basic logic remains exactly the same. So much so that the free trade agreements, FTAs, that govern the relationship between the European Union and its Mediterranean counterparts before the uprisings are relabeled deep and comprehensive after the uprisings. What do they do? The language is a clue. They essentially accelerate and intensify the nature of the programs before the uprisings. Uh, 
So it's, it's a question of intensification, acceleration. It's not a qualitative change. There's no paradigm shift as Stefan Fühler, uh, who was a uh, um, commissioner at the time uh, for the neighborhood, and um, Baroness Ashton, who was the head of the External Action Service at the time, and so on, claimed, right? Um, and as we'll see in more detail, the same goes for uh, the conception of democracy. So if we can move on to the next um, slide, please. So the conception of democracy, um, next slide, please. The conception of democracy that we find in these documents, next slide, please, um, is, uh, um, uh, well, it's complex. Here we go. Thank you very much. Um, the, in the preambles, if you read the preambles of these documents, um, they are holistic. They have multiple conceptions of democracy. They say, well, you know, we don't want to mandate one size doesn't fit all. Uh, we don't, we're not going to predetermine what democracy is all about. Um, that's for you uh, to determine your external um, third party countries, etc. Um, the second aspect that they, that they emphasize is this question of indivisibility of human rights. Right? If you have one, you either have all human rights or you have none. Right? And that sounds like a great idea, um, except in practice, it turns out that the European Union means something very specific when it says that. Um, thirdly, the question of let's say economic growth of development strategy. Like we said before, that strategy didn't change much at all. Uh, there's a new terminology which emphasizes inclusive growth, uh, but when we look at the mechanisms for that inclusive growth, they remain exactly the same kind of neoliberal, or auto liberal, depending on your theoretical preference, mechanisms that were being used beforehand. Okay. So when we look at the bodies of these documents, uh, there are several. There's, for example, the Partnership for Democracy and Shared Prosperity that was published on March 8th of 2011, right? So literally less than a month since Mubarak had been removed from office in the former president in Egypt, uh, about two months after uh, the success of the, uh, of the Tunisian revolution. And during the early days of the Libyan uprising, the uprising in Yemen, in Bahrain, in many other countries, right, to greater or lesser extents, or lesser extents. So if you look at this document, if you look at the new response for changing neighborhood, which has to do also with the Eastern Partnership, which came a couple of months later in May of 2011, uh, and all the subsequent documentation, what you notice is that uh, the claim to inseparability of human rights becomes what? What pattern do we see in these documents? We see essentially well, two patterns. First of all, a hierarchy between human rights in which civil and political rights, for example, the right to vote in elections, etc., uh, take precedence over social and economic rights, right? Uh, or the right to work, etc. Secondly, there's a selectivity, even in um, amongst uh, civil political rights. It's not civil and political rights in general that are being uh, foregrounded, associated with democracy, um, promoted by the European Union. No, it's certain categories, the so right to vote, for example, not so much the right, for example, to protest. The right to protest, the right to association um, is, especially the right to association is nominated, is mentioned a few times, but it's not, it's very much marginalized. And the right to protest is, uh, is very much off the radar in, in these uh, documents. Um, and actually, uh, uh, activists who uh, Gennaro Gervasio and I interviewed back in, uh, God, what was it, in 2009, even before the uprisings, um, they told us, look, uh, they highlighted this question of the selectivity of, of between human rights. You know, the right to vote is easy to promote, it's easy to champion, but the right to protest is not. And they called that difference the difference between easy rights and, and hard rights or tough rights. Yeah. There's another pattern, which is that social and economic rights, like I said, were being marginalized, but how? It's actually quite, uh, quite fascinating because democracy, the word democracy and its cognates, democratization, et cetera, is always associated with civil and political rights, or nearly always. 
but it's never associated with social and economic rights. It's associated with social and economic use in the sense, for example, that oh, we can have social and economic difficulties and that's a threat to democracy. Yeah, But those issues, that association is always negative. Yeah, And uh, it's always a lack of social and economic conditions that is a threat to democracy. And more importantly, those issues are never presented as uh, related to rights in any way. Something which never happens, a kind of demotion that never happens for civil and political rights. And the language that is used to associate, to describe the actors that defend these rights is also significantly different. So for example, when the European Union talks about civil society, uh, civil society conducts advocacy, it monitors, it participates effectively, it checks government excesses. It's very Tocquevillian, very orthodox liberal but what we're interested in here is that it's active language. Civil society does, right? Trade unions or social partners, as the, the nearly never called trade unions, instead, they partner, they're engaged in dialogue, and they're described in terminology which has them, uh, which describes them as quite passive, as ancillary to the process of development or democratization in a cooperative role, right? Uh, so when they mention them at all, which is very rarely. Um, finally, I want to move. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, there's this. This uh, at the bottom of the uh, the slide. In fact, there's something which is quite uh, important, and that this that is this this move from a language uh, of rights to a language of issues is completed by the fact that instead of talking about rights, for example, to uh, education, uh, to work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that language is replaced by language or programs of aid, trade, and investment. Right? Now, what does this do? It does two really important things. The first is that it shifts the competence of these issues away from external action service and into completely into, not that it wasn't there beforehand in some uh, way, but it pushes it over to other parts of the European Union of institutions. The DG Development and Cooperation, DG Trade, to IFIs, for example, the EBRD, the European Bank of Reconstruction, Reconstruction and Development, um, and so on. And what happens here is that the shift from the language of rights to the language of aid marks the movement from an entitlement to a concession. Right? Let me make this really simple. Um, if I have a right, then you... Uh, have an obligation to guarantee you, the state, have a go an obligation to guarantee that right. On the other hand, if you are aiding me, or if you are investing in my country, or if you are trading in my with my country, then all of these that were used to be entitlements become concessions, right? So the moral economy of, of this relationship is completely different. And in fact, uh, if we can move on to the next slide and final slide for this section, what can we, to sum up, what can we say about uh, the conceptual structure of the European Union, uh, of the of democracy in the, in the EMP? What does the European Union think it's doing when it promotes democracy? Well, we can say a couple of things. First of all, we've identified this hierarchy and selectivity in the conception of human rights. And we've seen that it has a, a very particular characteristics. It focuses on civil and political rights. It marginalizes social and economic rights and actors. And secondly, we've noticed that there is a moral economy that's associated with um, with this uh, with this shift you know, from rights to aid, etc. All this amounts to a, a very thin procedural notion of democracy, with the, which the European Union, sorry, European Union is promoting. Right um, now, of course, many uh, authors or several authors before myself and my colleagues have made this point, but the difference with our approach is that we show you the nitty gritty, we use a discourse analysis that is replicable, you can go and do your own analysis, etc., and tell us whether we're right or wrong, okay? Now, all of this stuff is important because it turns out that it's one of the reasons why this particular conception of democracy is one of the reasons why the European Union, at least in the neighbor, your southern neighborhood, is not a normative power. The fact that it abides or proclaims that it abides by its uh, uh, fundamental values and human rights, democracy, European way of life, 
uh, uh, brings it no credit in the, um, the, the Mediterranean neighborhood. Okay. Uh, so I have been very bad. I've not kept the time. Uh, do I have more time for the, the first uh, portion, Karim? Go ahead. Yes, please. Do, uh, do Perfect. Thank finish. you very much. So this is if we can go to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so uh, if we can um, go to the next slide, please. Uh, you've frozen. I hope you can hear me, but I can't hear you. Ah, here we go. Okay, so uh, in, in the second part, I promised that we would look at uh, uh, survey data and see what people uh, think, how they conceive of democracy in, in the Middle East. Of course, I'm being a bit cavalier in the sense that uh, the, the, the conceptions of democracy are multiple. It depends which kind of political or uh, affinity groups you're looking at, etc. But grosso modo, in general, what survey data allows us to do is it allows us to say at a national level, collectively taken, what do people on average think? It's not very useful if you want to try and look in detail at specific sections of society, etc. but it's very useful if you want to look at society in general. So with that caveat, um, and if anyone's interested in methodological issues, how do we know, for example, that these surveys uh, do what I said that they do, in other words, represent uh, average uh, opinion nationally, so to speak, uh, then please feel free to ask me in the um, Q&A. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. All right. So in this slide, what you, what you see is uh, data about uh, or responses to um, drivers of protest or support to protest. So people were asked in uh, you get this kind of question in a number of different surveys. This is data from the Arab Transformation Survey that, um, that I was involved with. Uh, but you, if you look at the Arab Barometer or you look at the World Value Survey, you get similar kinds of answers and similar kinds of questions. So people are asked, you know, did you support the uprisings uh, passively or actively? And if so, you know, in other words, protesting in the streets or supporting from afar. And, uh, and if you did support uh, the uprisings, then, uh, uh, you know, what motivated you? What were the couple of reasons that made you um, that made you uh, uh, protest or support protest? What I want you to focus on in in this uh, in this slide is not so much the individual uh, uh, country data as much as the shape of the data. So keep in mind, respondents have a long list of factors that they answer, and of these, what we did was we clustered some of those factors into factors that have to do with civil political rights, factors that have to do with the economy, jobs, that kind of stuff. Uh, basic services, education, water, health, and then corruption. Now, corruption is the only non-aggregate variable, right? Uh, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, because as you can see, it's uh, much larger than any other individual variable. So if you put it in any of the other categories, it skews the results. But secondly, and most importantly, corruption goes to the heart of the regime, the system, the nidam that people are protesting against, right? What is corruption? Is it political or is it economic? Of course, it involves both. Um, so uh, this is what drives people to protest, right? Notice, uh, keep in mind that this pattern Right? So the prominence of corruption and the importance of all factors, civil, political, economic and social, basic services, uh, the roundedness of this response, this is what we'll also find when we look at conceptions of democracy. Right. So if we can go to uh, the next slide. What the next slide shows us is that corruption, which was the main driver of the uprisings, the main uh, litmus test uh, of social and economic dislocation, discontent, dissent, yeah, is still a very big issue, right? So do people think 
uh, that, that governments actually did anything about corruption? No. Nine out of ten, roughly, with the exception of Libya, don't. But, I mean, Libya is a different question. Ask me about it in the Q&A. Um, but most importantly, do people think that however bad corruption is, that the government is doing something about it? That differential, which is what you see on the graph on the right there, on the table on the right there, serious because you could say well you know it's a serious problem but the government's dealing with it uh, what that what that table tells us is that you know it's a serious problem and governments are not dealing with it yeah next uh, slide please the next slide is important because what we'll see is that um protests far from being youth revolutions are actually uh, supported within each country where we conducted surveys uh, they're actually supported across all social major demographics. So if you talk about age group, it wasn't a youth revolution because um, uh, most age segments participated roughly equally within each country. If you talk about um, economic position, you know, household income, again, there isn't that much differentiation within each country. If you talk about education, for example, or gender or urban or rural location. Again, there isn't that much differentiation within each country. What does this tell us? It tells us that people were protesting from across the social spectrum. What does that tell us? It tells us that the failings of the regimes were structural, they were systemic, they weren't uh, the, the neglect of any particular social demographic. Okay, next slide, please. And in the next slide, what we see finally is uh, that the conceptions, people's conceptions of democracy. Again, people have a long list of factors to choose from, and then we uh, aggregated them, put them together, uh, depending on whether they pertained to political freedom, civil or political rights and freedoms, social uh, rights and inclusion, and economic rights and inclusion and conditions. Yeah, and as you can see, corruption is at least as important um, uh, as any other factor in all countries surveyed, right? Um, so again, what emerges from here is there's no single factor, there's no smoking gun, there's no smoking gun either in terms of social demographic or in terms of countries or in terms of the kinds of issues that people are protesting about. The one thing that they have in common or that is the roots or probably the root of uh, is this question of corruption. And a corruption is a failure, a systemic failure. Yeah, it, it points us towards the fact that these are systemic failures, right? Now, um, I will, can I ask uh, that we move to slide number 16? Um, so skip two slides and go directly to uh, trust in religious elites. There we go. Thank you very much. So this is a fascinating graph, and, and then I'll draw some conclusions. Uh, you could say, oh, well, you know, people were protesting were disillusioned with so-called secular regimes that were authoritarian, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see uh, at the right-hand side there, there are a lot of Western commentators who said, oh, the Arab Spring is going to be followed by the Islamist winter because the only alternative to these regimes is, you know, the radical political Islam. Um, it's a very kind of Huntingdonian or Lewisian, if you want, um, narrative there. Now, if we look at, um, and often actually that narrative is supported by appeals to uh, survey data saying, well, people consider themselves very religious, they have preferences for religious parties, etc. But if we go and look at that data, there's a couple of questions that are really interesting and not a lot of people talk about. If you ask people, uh, do you think that religious elites, religious leaders, should influence voters' decisions? And if you ask them, do you think religious leaders should influence government decisions, right, laws, etc., uh, state decisions? The response is, in most cases, in most countries, overwhelmingly negative, right? So the specter of a kind of Islamist winter the spectre of an Iranian-style revo revolution, etc. None of this is substantiated by facts. Um, so, if I can, uh, if I can ask to go to the penultimate slide, slide number twenty-one, so we can draw some conclusions. So, what do we know? What have we found out so far? 
On the one hand, we found that uh, populations that we've carried out surveys uh, for display quite a rounded notion of democracy. What's important uh, uh, in terms of democracy or conceptions of democracy or priorities for their countries, uh, etc. Um, in both of those instances, people answer quite consistently. They say, well, we want a political voice, we want political inclusion, so civil and political rights, and we want social and economic inclusion. We want social justice, which is very coherently with the kinds of slogans that, that we heard on the streets, etc. Um, and we want an end to corruption. What does that mean? It means uh, the civil, political, formal component of democracy is important, but it's not enough. The social and economic component of democracy is crucial, but not as an economic outcome of neoliberal policies a la European Union, but rather it's articulated in terms of social justice and social and economic rights. And this chimes very well with the kind of evidence that we have from other sources, yeah, from uh, analysis of social movements, participant observations, much more detailed interviews, focus groups, etc., that we have from other sources, right? Um. Okay, we seem to have lost uh, Andrea for a few All seconds. Them, certain ones more than others. And um, Andrea, secondly, I'm sorry to interrupt Andrea. Can you hear me? Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. So I'm afraid we you were slightly cut off uh, yeah. the, the last minute. I can hear you. If you could just retake um, the conclusions, um, sort of like we were seeing your... Are you there? Okay, it is a bit sketchy. Your sure. um, The Wi-Fi seems to have some issues, but now you're, you're back. Seeing okay. my what, sorry? So, the uh, the Wi-Fi I think is not very stable, so it tends to freeze uh, sometimes. And okay, wonderful. You, you you were cut the after you were summarizing um, the end of corruption and uh, all this um, uh, uh, inclusion of both um, political and socio economic um, uh, rights. Uh, you were in that last slide, so you were about to go to the second part of the conclusions. Perfect. Okay. So, on the other hand, the, the European Union, when it thinks it's promoting democracy, it does something completely different. Yeah. It promotes civil and political rights, but not all of them. Only uh, or primarily uh, the easy rights, as the activists uh, told us uh, 10 years ago. Um, and secondly, when it promotes um, economic growth, what it does, although it speaks about inclusive growth, it adopts strategies that we know produce social and economic dislocation, you know, the so-called uh, structural adjustment approach uh, to, to economic reform. Right? So when we put these two things together, what do we get? Well, we get trouble. Okay, what are the implications of this mismatch? Um, first of all, that the European Union and post-revolutionary governments or post-uprisings governments set up expectations in the population, but they don't deliver. They don't deliver because they can't deliver, because what the population is expecting is something completely different from what uh, the European Union um, is um, intends to promote. The second thing that emerges or the consequence of this mismatch is that the particular conception that the European Union has of democracy and its promotion and its allied dimensions like economic policy, um, they delegitimize dissent outside of that framework. Yeah, you see this really well in, in Tunisia, you see this very well in, in, uh, in Egypt, oh my God. Um, so insofar as it does that, it prevents itself and I'm speaking here, of course, of, of, of um, regional governments as well, 
it, it makes it impossible to hear the legitimate concerns that people still have. For example, think about corruption, think about the, the demand for regime change. What's the response by local governments, but especially by the European Union to the question of corruption? It's a technical one, right? We have to fix uh, rule of law issues, uh, increase transparency of the judiciary, judicial process, et cetera, right? Technical measures. But what people are doing when they protest back in 2010, 2011, and it became really clear with the Hirak in, in Algeria, on which you had a wonderful talk earlier in the, in the year, um, and, uh, and in Sudan, is that these are, not, uh, 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 these are not complaints that people have about specific leaders or about technical issues. They're about the regime itself, the system itself, the Nizam itself, right? So if that's true, then what this mismatch between what the European Union is supplying and what men and populations you know, demand, so to speak, um, if you put these things together, what do we get? We get a, the, the structural conditions for destabilization, not just of the Middle East itself, but of the Mediterranean region and therefore of the European Union itself. Indeed, to the point that it undermines the European Union's own goals, its own self-interested, narrow-minded goals around, for example, migration control, whether one agrees with them or not, the fact is that the structure within which EN, ENP is designed, the neighborhood policy is designed, is likely to make these issues worse in the, in the long term rather than uh, better. Now, the question that emerges from all of this um, is why? Why would the European Union put itself in this kind of mess? Um, there's, there are several answers. One is a kind of geopolitical answer. Well, the European Union talks about democracy, but in reality, it's interested in geopolitical uh, influence, security, uh, economic, raw economic interest, etc. There's, there's truth to that, uh, but it's not the whole truth. The other answer is, well, but it, it doesn't really know what it's doing. Because uh, you know, people, policymakers in national capitals as well as in Brussels itself, think a part of an epistemic community where the dominant paradigm is this neoliberal type of reasoning connection between politics, democracy, and, and, and economics that we've outlined here. And there is also truth to that. Truth to that. But my suspicion is this is what my future research is going to be about, um, my suspicion is actually that the answer is deeper. Um, and that is that if you think about the groups, the issues that are excluded from European Union discourse, namely social and economic rights and the actors who defend them, um, it strikes me that those are precisely the issues and the actors that have been marginalized in the last, over the last 40, 45 years in Europe itself. Western Europe and then European Union, yeah? So it strikes me that it's very difficult since this is the, the trend within Europe, the trend politically, ideologically, et cetera, it's very difficult for the European Union to then promote precisely those issues, precisely those actors that it's marginalizing domestically in its abroad. From this point of view, um, you know, we need to think, um, a bit more trans-regionally about the politics of democracy, or the politics of security, the politics of uh, development and economics, etc. Politics of democracy in our case. And I have this nagging suspicion that actually, so to speak, the heart of over there, speaking about the South Mediterranean, is actually over here, in other words, inside Europe itself. And on that note, I will um, stop. Uh, and um, if anyone is interested in there's the last slide, there's a series of other publications that uh, I and my collaborators have been uh, working on over the last few years that are available to people. Um, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, uh, for, for a, a, a very, um, uh, I, I would say, uh, encompassing uh, can't hear uh, lecture on not only what what's happening or what what's happened in the EU, uh, EU in terms of of paradigm, but also uh, what are the demands of uh, of uh, of the uh, of the MENA uh, peoples and and societies. Uh, before uh, carrying on, I think I was slightly frozen as well for you. Um, 
I will just uh, remind our students that uh, they should state uh, on the chat their uh, program, their names, full names and program, so uh, we can uh, add them to uh, the attendance list. Uh, also, uh, kindly, uh, Andrea has sent us his uh, slides and we will share them with uh, your uh, two uh, professors and therefore you will have access to uh, the the slides that uh, you have been watching not only the ones that andrea has used but uh, the ones that he hasn't used uh, that are also uh, very interesting um and um without further ado i will uh, ask uh, jordi i mean i have my own comments and uh, and, and questions but I will ask Jordi to now um, use his microphone. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Karim. Thank you to, so much to Casa Arabe and also Iñaki for the organization of this event and also EMET. And obviously, thank you to Andrea. Um, it's, it's equally fascinating to hear you than to read your scholarship. So I'm really happy to be here and to, and to share with you some of my personal thoughts on all what you said. Um, really quick, I have like three really short questions that came up into my mind while you were delivering your, your presentation. Uh, number one, uh, I was really surprised about the absence of a very specific concept that I thought that for many, many years was crucial in the European Union's conception of democracy towards the Middle East. And this was the concept of inclusiveness. Mm? Uh, by the time, by, by 2013, when the coup in Egypt um, changed many, many things over, uh, obviously in Egypt, but in the EU conception of what was happening, uh, many European Union officers claimed that the problem of Morsi's government was that it was not inclusive enough, hmm? that they lacked the ability to be inclusive, to include father voices be uh, beyond the one of its own party. And, and to me, I think that this talks about uh, a very specific conception of, of the European Union, a, a very specific conception of the Union's uh, democracy, meaning uh, in, in many different occasions, I, I thought that uh, the Union is not so much interested in, in a delivery democracy that, uh, that uh, stresses the outcomes of democracy, the socially shared outcomes of democracy, public goods, but rather, uh, at that point, it seems that it was stressing an organic conception of democracy by, by which the most important thing was who was included in decision making. Huh? And, and, and so I, want, I wonder what you think about the, the, the role of inclusiveness, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these this circumstances I'm talking about in 2013 in Egypt and from that point onwards. To me, uh, this echoes many different opinions that we heard, firstly, in the context of the Dayton agreements, so to solve very specific situations, you need to include everyone on board. But specifically in the region, it also echoed the Taif agreement logics. So the logics of the end of the war in Lebanon, by, by, by which uh, you solve many of the problems, but you included everyone in decision making. That to me also goes against many of the fundamentals of democratic procedures within the European Union. Hmm? This is something I would like you to, if you could comment a little bit. Secondly, uh, I also have a question on the effects of time on, on everything that you described here. Um, I, I wonder what were the changes on, on this narrative of, uh, as the time passed by, as the situation changed. And specifically, as you mentioned in your last part of your speech, not only in the Middle East region as such, but also within the European Union. Huh? From 2011 onwards, uh, we have seen the unfolding of great difficulties within the Union to, uh, from a democratic perspective, like the very strong difficulties within democracy, the European democracies to deliver uh, some of those social outcomes that you have been describing here. Uh, so I'm sure that this was not the best historical moment for the EU to use this as part of its own narrative, as it was struggling internally. And to me, this, this is connected to some of the ideas that Hamid Dabashi suggested by 2011, 2012, when he claimed that, uh, that some of the essential, he claimed that there was an essential transnational nature 
of social justice protests worldwide. And, and, and to me, this is part of the, the effects of time in, in the protest. And the third question, and I don't want to monopolize my time, this time that I have allocated to, to, to make some comments. I wonder if you have um, discovered in your research any gap between discourse and policy at the European Union level? Because you have described the evolution of discourses, but I wonder is, if there is a gap here. Uh, has the European Union at any level done something different on the ground that, than everything that they set uh, but in any major policy strategy report? Meaning, is there any difference between top-level top level politics and what the Union is doing and the people working on the ground is doing? So those would be my, my, my three comments and questions. Thank you so much for, 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 for your speech. And, and, I'm, and I'm here to hear what you have to say about everything. Thank you. Great questions. Great questions. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, I, the connection wasn't brilliant on the first question, but if I understand it correctly, you're talking, you were asking about whether there was a tension between the approach to conflict resolution uh, that you can see in places like the Taif or Dayton Accords, you know, inclusiveness, everyone mm -hmm. on the board, as opposed to the, the, the approach within the European Union model and whether there's an attention there and so on. Um, I think I'm going to have to think about that because when you were talking about inclusiveness, before you mentioned Taif and Dayton, I was thinking about, um, well, ironically, about the rhetoric versus practice because way back in 20, 2009, 2010, before the uprisings, uh, my colleague and I, Gennaro Gervasi and I, were doing this research uh, in Egypt, between Egypt and Brussels. It was specifically, and this also goes to your third point, it was specifically about um, where civil society funding actually ended up in places like Egypt. Yeah? What was interesting to us at the time, and little did we know that this was going to be significant then in, in 2011, was that it seemed to us that um, you know, people like uh, Mahabd al-Rahman and, and others who had looked at civil society in Egypt were absolutely correct that the European Union, that, sorry, that civil society sphere in Egypt was being flooded by gongos, quangos, uh, co-opted uh, individuals, organizations, etc. What that meant, part of, you know, that was part of the reason, is that civil society funding in various guises um, under the guise of development aid or, or civil society funding, the, the EIDHR one and two, etc. Right? What it was ending up in the organisations that were co-opted mostly by the regime. Okay, but not only that, the organisations that opposed the regime very often made the explicit decision that they would not even apply to European Union funding. So I remember, for, for a whole series of reasons, uh, support of Mubarak, the fact that in one, of, one of the activists actually put it beautifully. He said, well, you know, we would be applying to the European Union, which is the same organization, along with the Egyptian government, that is creating the problems we're trying to solve, right? There's a paradox of the civil society industry, the aid industry is right there. So, and I remember going to, to a, a, um, a department lead in what used to be Relex and saying, look, you know, here it is. It's this exactly what I just told you. And I remember this person saying to me, my God, you should go back to Cairo immediately and, and, and tell them to apply, right? This speaks to your third question, right? Uh, because clearly there's a disjoint between frontline and, uh, and, and what's going on on the ground. One of the areas where you don't have that disjoint so much right, is in the area of funding, of using civil society funding uh, uh, to put towards, um, shall we say, religious organizations, Islamist organizations in particular. There was an informal red line in Brussels at the time um, around that, which was articulated ironically in terms of inclusiveness. If there isn't gender inclusiveness, then we won't fund, which are the organizations that do you know, most gender exclusiveness. Uh, well, there are a series of a series of them, but the ones that, that one of the consequences of this, ironically, is that this blanket red line, combined with the unwillingness to apply for funding in the first place, meant by certain organisations, meant that the European Union wasn't in a position to know 
uh, who or fund um, support in, in some way, politically or economically, whatever. Um, after the uprisings or during the uprisings, it wasn't a position to know who the progressive sections of Islamist organizations were, which in Egypt, for example, turned out to be absolutely crucial in the 2012 elections. Yeah. So anyway, so there's this, this interesting tension between discourse versus practice, top versus ground level, inclusiveness, the question of, of Islamist organizations, and so on. Um, the second question, uh, I think Dabashi is not wrong when he says that, you know, there's this kind of shared core to protest worldwide. And in a way, it's not at all surprising, because if you think about, think about the discursive structure of democracy, the way that we've spoken about this in, in this talk, what does it do? It says, effectively, I'm paraphrasing on the caricaturing, it says, well, you can only have civil and political freedoms if you choose the people who are, you know, going to support our political and economic reform program. And you, you can't have social and economic rights because those are going to be delivered as outcomes in the long term. God knows, you know, as Keynes said, in the long term, we're all dead. Um, uh, they're going to be delivered as outcomes of social and economic policy, macroeconomic policy, anything from microcredits to FDI, whatever, right? SEZs and so on. So it's not surprising that people are protesting about along exactly these two axes. Yeah. And corruption for me is symbolic because precisely it represents the, <laughs> the core of the regime that, that rests on these two kinds of axes. I hope I've answered the questions a little bit. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, so thank much. you very much. Thank you to, to both of you. And we are starting to, um, to get some questions uh, from our audience. So here goes the first one from uh, Melania Brito Clavijo. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Teti. Thanks for your intervention. It was through the reading of a book on the boycott movement of, for Palestine uh, that I got to read the association agreement between the EU and Israel. You were saying before that depending on the country, the EU would give priority to the promotion of certain rights, referring to these two patterns you were mentioning before. Now, I know Palestine participates in the ENP. My question is, where is the commitment of the EU in the promotion of human rights in Palestine? And why hasn't it activated article number two of the association agreement with Israel, which literally states that relations between the parties should be based on respect for human rights? Was shall I shall I answer here? that? Or? Okay, yes, sure. No, yes. I mean, should we collect? Uh, I have to say, I, I have an interest in Palestine, Israel, but I'm not a specialist, so I'll I'll leave that the answer to to specialists. I think, I mean, I think for me, what's more important than the selectivity that might be due to specific, uh, say, geopolitical uh, contexts is the selectivity that's built into the model. Yeah. So if you have a model, a, an approach, an epistemic framework, you know, a way of thinking, right, or at least a way of framing policy and public debate, yeah, um, that marginalizes, that excludes uh, certain categories of rights, and that says that it's possible to be selective about the kinds of rights that we apply, we pursue, defend, etc. Then that's the groundwork within which your question emerges in the first place. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think that's that's my, I realize that it's a partial answer, but that's the answer that I'm going to give. Shift it back to the Thank epistemic you. framework. A question from Daniel Martin, who thanks you also for your intervention. You have spoken about the concept of uh, European government's supply of market democracy and how neoliberalism has negatively impacted the process of 
democratization in the MENA region. In your opinion, to what extent ex external factors like the debt crisis that struck the EU in the 2010-2012 period, how, how, to what extent has that influenced EU policy in terms of the uh, democratization process conceived for the region? Sorry, to what extent, which factors? The, um, the um, um, external factors like the debt crisis that struck the EU in, in, the, in that period of 2010-2012, how, uh, how yes. did those external factors or to what extent did they influence the policy or the democratization policy towards the MENA region? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, it connects back to a, a point that Jordi asked me about and I <laughs> forgot to answer um, so the, about the Bashi. The initial uh, surface answer, if you will, the obvious answer is that the uprisings happen a few years after the global financial crisis. And so at that time, in particular, European states, um, had uh, balance budgetary issues. <laughs> In other words, they were poorer than they usually were. And so if you ask, uh, if you ask policymakers at the time, if you ask people embedded in institutions or making decisions about, you know, how much budget to allocate to, for example, civil society support, uh, they will say, well, we tried to do the best that we could. We, and it's true, scrambling to put together budgets, um, pieces of budgets, etc. Uh, there were real conversations about how best to support um, uh, the transitions that were happening uh, in, in the region. Uh, but that's only a part of an answer. So, you know, less money, debt, financial crisis meant less money, which meant trying to figure out how to do less with more. Okay. But that's only a surface, and I think it's only a very partial answer. It's not, it's not a very satisfying answer. Because the root problem is in the, uh, it's, well, it's in the entire regulatory framework. It's in the way that we think about the relationship between politics and markets. What do I mean by this? I mean that if what the model that the European Union as a whole and its member states is pursuing is a so-called market-driven growth, whether it's market democratization outside of Europe or market-driven growth inside Europe, uh, you have to either deregulate or in any case give kind of um, corporate incentives, incentives of foreign direct investment, etc. And we know what the story is in terms of the, uh, the neoliberal slash auto liberal response, which is cut taxes on uh, corporations in such a way that uh, growth uh, is achieved and it will eventually trickle down, right? If you're working inside that framework, then you have the first problem. Oh, I don't have as much money, right? So there is, in other words, a problem with the tax base of states. The, the economic strategy, the macroeconomic strategy that's being pursued reduces that tax base effectively, right? And that's the reason why we have less money. It's not necessarily, the global financial crisis is a consequence of all of this. The debt crisis is a consequence of all of this. And the worst thing is that the, the, the lack of um, uh, paradigm shifts in that direction. So the fact that we're still working in terms of uh, free trade uh, agreements is just deep and comprehensive free trade agreements with all the financial instruments that, that involves, et cetera. That, what that does is it means that it makes the debt crisis and the social and economic inequalities worse. So it makes the problem worse, not better. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Isaias Barreñada, from a professor at the University of Complutense. Uh, he asks if, um, um, in, the question is, in most southern countries, there are now technocratic governments. Does this reinforce the depoliticized approach of the European Union?
Did you hear the question, Andrea? Hold on a second. We can't hear you. We lost your audio. You, you can't hear me? I think you are unable to hear me. I, I, I couldn't hear the question. Could you repeat it? Okay. The, the question, I repeat the question. Uh, in most southern countries, there are now technocratic governments. This now, yes. The, the depoliticized approach of the European Union. Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Hi, I'm so okay. sorry, I'm so sorry. It's okay, it's okay. We're having some issues with the connection. In most southern countries of the Mediterranean, there are now technocratic governments. Does this reinforce the depoliticized approach of the European Union? Yes and no. Uh, they're only technocratic uh, if you think that they're not, that what they're doing is not political. But of course, in so far as we remain inside the logic that we were talking about in the previous question, you know, how do we deal with politics? How do we deal with economics? Um, if we remain inside the logic of how we answer those questions, then yeah, of course, they're technocratic. But technocratic just basically means uh, 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 business as usual. And business as usual is exactly what we don't need. We need to be able to think outside of the box, outside of a box that got us into this mess in the first place. Um, and sorry, the, I forgot the second part of the question to the political. Oh, does it reinforce the European Union? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a convergence of ways of thinking. I mean, I mean, I would say, I would say this, there's a, there's a sense in which what I'm saying is extremely superficial, right? Because we're talking, what we're doing, and this is why Jordi's question was, was really useful, discourse versus practice. We're talking at the level now, we're talking at the level of uh, what the rhetorical surface is, right? What does the European Union say it's doing? What do uh, local southern partnership countries say that they're doing, right? But as we say in Italian, between saying and doing, there's an entire seat, right? right? And often the, the interesting stuff is precisely in that gap between discourse and practice, rhetoric and reality. Um, and from that point of view, it strikes me that for example, the European Union talks about, uh, you know, market liberalization, but in fact, it, those who say that this is not a neoliberal intervention, but an auto liberal intervention are actually, you know, logic is absolutely correct. You know, what the European Union is doing is not so much deregulating markets as re-regulating markets, regulating them differently. Uh, for anyone who hears the echoes, this is, uh, you know, Karl Polanyi and so on. And as far as uh, Southern Partnership countries are concerned, you know, there is, but I mean, this is also true of, of my own country, Italy, right? Uh, there's a tension between rhetoric and reality, which is different, which is that rhetoric and reality, that gap between discourse and practice is in some ways performative. Helle Malmvig has a, a great analysis from a few years ago, which she says, look, um, what, uh, what MENA governments are doing is not simply kind of rejecting, resisting, opposing democratization uh, uh, rhetoric. What they're doing is they're accepting it to some extent, adapting it, changing it in such a way as to delay or diffract, uh, or diffuse the effects that in theory, in rhetoric are supposed to follow from, from that way of thinking, right? The interesting thing, I'm finishing writing a paper on this right now. The interesting thing is that this is, um, one might say that this is also exactly what the European Union is doing, right? Is the European Union really interested in promoting democracy, uh, you know, 
in popular sense or in its own limited sense, cynics would say no. Yeah. If they are right, then the framework within which the European Union talks about democracy, human rights, etc., is perfect for not doing the thing that they're saying they want to do. Okay. Um, so I, I think that that, you know, everything is in, or there's a very important clear, uh, or a very important uh, key of interpretation for decoding these relationships in that tension between discourse and, and practice between rhetoric and reality that we were talking about earlier on with Jordan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, we're, so far that's all the questions we have from our students or audience. Um, I had a question regarding um, this um, perception of uh, the people of the region on how um, committed is the EU uh, with democracy or democratization? And specifically, it's related to, I mean, you did mention the geopolitical interests of the EU uh, and that they're overtaking any other considerations, or at least that's a hypothesis uh, that explains that mismatch um, between between uh, rhetoric and and action, and uh, I mean clearly, crises such as Libya uh, or Syria uh, might just be like a nail in the coffin of the EU's um, reputation in the region. I mean, the, I think particularly Libya, where you see countries such as France and Italy uh, intervening in such a blatant way. I don't know what if you have managed to measure what that has done to the uh, Europeans' uh, image uh, in terms of Democrats in the region. Well, it, it can't do, the latest survey is two years ago, but, but that's besides the point. I think that, uh, first of all, even if, let me say this, even if European countries didn't intervene directly in places like Libya, they would still be um, suffering quite understandably the effects of a negative reputation. Why? Again, because if your entire policy framework, if the entire framework within which you think and act um, contradicts the foundations of what people want, so to speak. You know, nothing particularly good can happen <laughs> when, that, when that's the premise, you know. Um, uh, you know, whether, whether that's intended or not, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to suggest that, you know, everyone in Brussels is plotting and scheming the downfall of, you know, um, popular protest movements and so on. There are a lot of people who are genuinely interested in, in gen genuinely trying to make a difference over the last 10, 15 years. But, uh, what, what's, what's dispiriting is the fact, for example, uh, yesterday or today, I, I fail to remember, Mario Draghi, who's the current Italian prime minister, said that he thinks that everything's fine in Libya. <laughs> Everything is not fine in Libya. And it's not fine in Libya, but it's also not fine for Italy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Mauricio Spindola, um, who's particularly interested in the interactions between the US and the Arab world. Um, the EU and the US have opted for a policy of promoting democracy in the Maghreb and the Middle East. However, after the Iraq experience, many Arabs and Muslims reaffirm that they do not support the United States as a guarantor of the democratizing process. This collides with their interests and hegemony in the area, and they do not want their countries to perpetuate themselves as extensions of American foreign policy. In what way do you think these past experiences uh, by the United States could affect a democratizing process in the Arab world? 
Right. So it's more related to the US than to Europe. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the general question is, uh, the general question that underpins this is, uh, you know, what's the role of external actors in possible democratization movements, and democratization? You know, if, if, for example, we ask, you know, Huntington, the Huntingtonian question, why is the Middle East not part of the third wave? Why is the fourth wave failed? We end up giving these kind of culturalist answers. But a key component of the answer for me has to be the international level. And by international level, I mean both at a regional level and globally, right? So, for example, um, consider going back to the US, consider what the US under Obama very early on said, how it spoke about the Egyptian uprising. Uh, what was going on in the, sort of there was a moment at which there were sort of protests in in Iran uh, while the Bahraini protests were going on. Right, it was fascinating because they were very lukewarm on you know on, on the Egyptian uh, question, very strong on the on the Iranian side, but said absolutely nothing about protests in Bahrain. Um, another another aspect which I think was is interesting and, and telling about the, also the interplay between regional and, and global powers was on I remember quite well on the evening of the 9th of February 2011. Um, then Senator McCain, who's since deceased, came out of a um, of a, a Senate Foreign Affairs Committee meeting, and he gave an interview in which he said, "Well, you know." we considered the possibility that maybe part of the aid that we provide the uh, uh, the egyptian states not the military um, there's a t grand total of about three billion us um, annually that goes uh, towards state and military at the end of this aid maybe we might consider the possibility of tying it to some human rights uh, standards issues so a very lukewarm statement. The following morning, the Saudis put out a statement saying, uh, even if the US were to tomorrow withdraw every single dime of US support to the Egyptian state, we would replace it overnight. Now that tells you two things. First of all, that the Saudis at the time had a lot of loose change and set well, not that much as in the past, but they had a lot, uh, more than me anyway. And um, uh, and secondly, that they were terribly afraid of the possibility, even the possibility of discussing this kind of move, right? Uh, so one way or another, international, uh, international states, whether this was a serious proposal or not, it's besides the point, are crucial. And in fact, what's the primary difference to my mind between the 2010-2011 uprisings, the Arab Spring, the Arab uprisings, and uh, uh, and the 1989 you know, events in Europe, which was a, an important parallel that was being made a lot at the time, 10 years ago. It's that in that context, at that time, there was what you could call a permissive international environment. Right? Neither the Soviet Union, nor the Americans, nor the European, West Europeans were opposed to what was going on there. In the case of the Arab uprisings, it's exactly the opposite. Both regional and global powers were either extremely lukewarm, even publicly, or downright opposed to what was going on. Um, and Turkey, Russia is a different kettle of fish, but ask me about that some other time. Uh, we will we will do a, a different session on on, on those. Uh, oh, um, I think we had a question from Ignacio, who has literally disappeared uh as we speak uh unfortunately okay is he back no he's not back oh, oh, oh sorry yes i'm sorry it was a technical mistake okay thank you very much andrea we have some questions here because we are with a group of students who, by the way, have asked three questions so far. So we have uh, two questions. I will tell you as quick as I can. 
The first one is by Habiba Bayadin, which is a student coming from Glasgow. And she says, in the slides, corruption and economy were the top two reasons for protest. So don't you think that economic reform in these countries is a more pressing priority than promoting democracy, at least in these transitional years? And the second question is coming from uh, Miriam Rees from Italy. And she says, do you think that EU is aware of her of its political failure? And if yes, if European Union does know that it, it has failed, where do you think the problem is? In which step or level of the political decision making process we can find the region and the cause of this failure? Thank you. Brilliant, great. Thanks for those questions. Um, I think I only found, heard two, but I'll answer those two first as, as quickly as I can. First of all, um, the question about prioritizing economic reform as opposed to democracy. Um, I think, I see where you're coming from, um, but I think the question is ill-posed because I think what the data is telling us, I mean, I'm talking about survey data, but you know, field work tells us more or less the same thing. Um, what the data is telling us is that you can't have one without the other, but people don't want one without the other. So if we stay within this model that we either have to have security first or economic reform first or political reform first, um, it, it, I think we stay inside a framework that isn't helping us. Um, so that's, that's one aspect. Um, so I think what you need to do is you need to pursue both simultaneously, not prioritizing one over the other, but you need to do it differently. Yeah. The toolkit that we've been using so far hasn't, uh, hasn't helped. Um, uh, the second question I heard was uh, whether the European Union is aware of its failures and where's the problem? Um, I think some, it depends what you mean by failure. I think that the fact that there isn't a democratic transition occurring in most uprisings countries, yes, of course, they're aware of that. Um, are they aware of the degree to which I suggest uh, not myself only, but others, um, their policies have contributed to that? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. so. To some extent, yes, but, but most of the time, the kind of answer that you get, especially from around about 2013, 15 onwards, is, yeah, we're, we're aware that, it, that democratization has failed, but we're also aware that, um, that uh, you know, we could do nothing else than change priorities away from democratization, specifically back towards security, right? So why security? Because we have the return of this notion that if you have security and stability first, like economic growth, like uh, political democratization, etc., and of course, this is all instrumental to the agenda, especially driven by certain member states to control migration, yeah. Um, and that's my sense is that it's precisely this axis of security and migration that's driving policy since, especially since 2015. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, insofar as we haven't managed to shift to change paradigms, so going back to the first question, um, then, then no, the, the answer is no, they're not aware of the extent of the problem because they wouldn't acknowledge the need to change that paradigm in the first place or that it's politically possible to do so and they're not entirely wrong on the second count i hope that answers the questions uh okay well we have just uh six more minutes left um we do have a couple of questions i don't know if ignacio has something more there or yeah. You're happy. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. let's let's finish with with two questions, uh, and uh, you are allowed to be short in your answers. Um, so, uh, from um, uh, Victoria Campbell uh, Gillies, she asks uh, if we can expect significant Chinese and Russian 
advance uh, advancement in the MENA region uh, post Arab Spring. And our last question, which is uh, quite uh, deep, uh, probably uh, more it relates to political philosophy. But the Fundación Horacio Ducharne uh, says that philosopher Amartya Sen affirms that democracy is contrary to human rights because the majority ends smashing ends up smashing the minority. Furthermore, today today's democracies are uh, much more um, of a government of the largest minority and not the majority at all. Do you agree? Could you, could you just repeat the last part of the last question? So Amartya Sen says... Amartya Sen st says that a democracy is opposite to human rights because the majority ends up smashing the minority. So do you agree that today's democracies are much more of uh, the government led by the largest minor minority rather than the majority? You have four minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, that's a god. We should have a seminar just on that. Four minutes. So, um, so Victoria Campbell's question first uh, is, you know, more influence from Russia and, and, and China. Yeah, of course, there's that possibility, if for no other reason than for, you know, the, the economic capability, etc. Whether China will choose to do so, whether it's in its interest to do so is a different kettle of fish and so on. Uh, Russia as well. But I would like to op I would like to point out one thing, that the one thing that the European Union has that these global geopolitical competitors don't, or they had, um, is precisely the attractiveness of a democracy, right, to the people. So what this does is it, it highlights an opportunity, a missed opportunity, but it's still an opportunity. The European Union has a possibility for a different kind of geopolitical approach driven by, um, driven by values uh, allied with interests, but in what sense? I mean, inspired by the second question, go back to Pericles' funeral oration in uh, the history of Peloponnesian War. Everyone in IR remembers the, oh, the Median dialogue, but Pericles, when he talks about the power of Athens, what does he say? He says, yes, we are powerful economically. Yes, we're powerful militarily. But why is that? The root of that power is that we are an open city, an open culture, etc. Right? inclusive, adaptive, etc. Now, regardless of how <laughs> inclusive ancient Athens actually was, but the point is well taken, right? If the European wants to be that kind of power, then it has an advantage over others. You know, an advantage, for example, the Americans squandered 70 years ago, but whatever. As far as the question of political philosophy, you know, I think it depends what, you know, A, the easy answer is it depends what kind of democracy you're talking about. Um, and secondly, but the more important answer is, I think, what you could call Plato's problem. You know, why is Plato accused of being a proto-fascist, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Because he mandates all these institutional structures that are designed from preventing, you know, uh, that one group takes control of society, etc. What's his problem fundamentally? His problem is intention. It's human intentions. Um, Sen is, yes, of course, if human beings are terrible human beings, then that will follow, you know, then the, his uh, argument follows. But it's not that simple. Um, I don't think that we can make that inference based on the institutional design, so to speak, um, of politics alone. And thank you very much for these questions and for your patience with the wobbly connection. Fantastic. That's, that's brilliant. In those four minutes, you did manage to, to squeeze all that. Um, Andrea Petty, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this for this session. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, both uh, the University of, of Barcelona and the uh, Autonomous University of, of Madrid, uh, the, their master's programs. Uh, thanks also to the Instituto Europeo del Mediterráneo, to the Mediterranean Institute, uh, uh, European Institute in Barcelona. And although this is an all-male panel, uh, we are we apologize. We normally 
do try to do to keep a gender balance, but for some uh, reason uh, it, we didn't keep it today. It was just a, a, a matter of the uh, star alignment. But that doesn't go without saying that uh, our colleagues uh, Olivia Orozco, Elisabetta Ciuccarelli, uh, Ruth Pimentel are obviously instrumental in uh, making making this happen. So thank you to uh, all of them, to all of uh, the students who have been connected, uh, the audiences also uh, uh, abroad. Uh, and uh, thank you for all the insights. As we said, you may also, we will share with you the slides that generously uh, Andrea Tetis has shared with us. Um, and I personally have learned a lot. I, I now probably will, 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 uh, will, will be more careful when thinking about what a thin democracy is. It just seems like thin ice uh, for some reason. It's, uh, it's a bit scary. Um, but uh, if you want to see this again uh, or recommend it to your friends, we, uh, we will have it on our website, uh, casarabe.es. Uh, uh, all of our uh, conferences are there. So I don't know if you have anything else to add before we go. Just thank you very much for having me. It's been uh, wonderful. Uh, I've enjoyed this a lot, despite my, uh, I apologize for my connection issues. And yes, thank you very much. I hope it was useful. Thank you, everyone. Grazie, grazie mille, Andrea. Muchísimas gracias, buenas tardes.